we're going to be talking about not slapping ourselves on the back here and congratulating ourselves. We're going to be talking about what, we, what needs fixing. So the problem is every year in the UK, £20.3 billion is spent on all forms of advertising and marketing. Of that, 4% is remembered positively, 7% is remembered negatively, 89% isn't noticed or remembered. Call it 90% of advertising isn't noticed or remembered. Roughly 17, 18 billion quid pissed away by so-called experts. So why is that? What goes wrong? Well, usually it's, it's bad thinking. It's stupid people think complicated is clever and smart people know you have to go beyond complicated to get to simple. But stupid people love things complicated. So it goes wrong strategically, it goes wrong at the brief. So the strategist just dumping a load of information and thinking the more information you've got, the better. When it isn't, the strategist hasn't done their job. Their job isn't to make it more complicated, their job is to make it simpler. The strategist's job is to have less and less and less and reduce it down until it's amazingly simple. Now, most people don't want to do that because it doesn't make their job look very important. They don't want to do that because their job looks more important when it's more complicated. The proof of that is if you go into any creative department nowadays and you ask any creative what they think their job is. And any creative will tell you their job is either content curation or heuristics or algorithms or big data or native advertising or storytelling or mobile optimized or wearable tech or cross-platform rich media solutions or they'll tell you their job is SEO, CRM, CSR, CTR, CMS, UGC, KPR or ROI. Now for me there's only three letters missing which is WTF. <laughs> the thing with strategy is you can't solve a problem at the level that you created it. You have to get upstream of the problem and change it to a different problem. The for instance we always use is uh, two explorers going through the jungle and they hear a tiger roar and they hear the tiger running towards them and one explorer gets down and starts lacing up his running shoes and the other explorer says you're crazy if you think you're going to outrun a tiger. And the first explorer says I don't have to outrun a tiger, I just have to outrun you. You can't solve a problem of outrunning a tiger, but if you get upstream of it, the tiger, doesn't, the tiger can't eat two people, it can only eat one, so all I've got to do is make sure it's not me. That's predatory thinking, that's getting upstream and changing the problem. Let's have a look at, if we get back to basics and look at um, the history of media. Einstein said, you can't, if you can't explain it to an 11 year old, you haven't really understood it. What we've got at the moment is we are full of people who can't explain anything to an 11 year old. They know all the long words, but they couldn't explain anything to an 11 year old, which means they don't really understand what they're doing. So, let's go back and keep it simple. We know there is power in simplicity and weakness in complexity. Because if we keep it simple, there's nowhere to hide. People use long language because they can hide behind it. You keep the language simple, you can't hide behind it. So let's go back and look at the history of uh, media. Can you all see this? Yeah? Great. That's the consumer. Now the first way we tried to get to the consumer was oil paintings and cave paintings. And you tried to get to the consumer that way. We did messages that way. Then what happened? Along came photography. And we tried to get to the consumer that way. Then it all changed again. And along came film. And that was a new way to get to the consumer. Then it all changed again. And along came digital. And that was the new way to get to the consumer. Then it all changed again and along came social. 
That was a new way to get to the consumer. This passes it on to this, to this, to this, to this. When you were little, you did it in the playground. You told jokes to your mates who told that joke to someone else, who told it to a boy at another school, who told it to his mates, who to another school. Pretty soon it went viral. Women do it over the garden fence, or my mum used to anyway, over the garden fence. Uh, men tell the jokes in the pub, they get repeated. You can do it with email, you can do it over the telephone, you can certainly use social media. But anything that's available is how you'll use it to go viral. And it goes viral here, not here. If you depend on that, you become part of the 18 billion quid that dies and never gets seen or noticed. Because it dies on the screen and it never gets through to here. What gets through is a great idea. There's no point in delivering something that's rubbish. Right. What I was going to just show you is diminishing marginal returns, which is, this is a graph, and on this axis is value, and on this axis is effort, or time. And usually, pretty much, you get a parabolic curve. Now, as you see, if you put this much effort into that part of the parabolic curve, you get this much reward. But we don't do that. We put this much effort into this part of the parabolic curve and we get this much reward. So you get four times the reward here that you get there for half the effort. You put in double the effort on the details and on the execution and fucking about with the technology and you get this teeny little bit of reward that if at the beginning of the process you got the basics right, you get that much reward for much less effort. That's why you, you keep it simple and you get the basics right. And you learn what the real media is. And instead of putting your effort in to here and trying to get this to work and learning more and more long words about more and more fashionable, trendy technology and wondering why it doesn't work, you put your effort into understanding human beings and how human beings work, you get the basics right, and you get incredibly much more reward. Now, Bill Birnbach said, our proper area of study is simple, timeless human truths. What makes all human beings the same? Whatever race, whatever religion, there's simple, timeless, fundamental human truths that make all people the same. That's our proper area of study, and that belongs there. Technology belongs there. This is what technicians do. This is what creative people do. Now, behavioural economics is described as human understanding for business advantage. So human understanding is here with Bill Birnbach's simple, timeless human truths. And if we have human understanding, we'll be there and we'll get business advantage. So if we look at human understanding, keeping it simple, keeping it simple, how do humans work? How does the mind work? The mind is our media. Not whatever the latest trendy gimmick is, the latest piece of technology. The mind is our media. How does the mind work, the human mind? And keeping it simple, it's always worked the same, it's never worked any different. It works like a funnel. A conversation is like a funnel. It must work this way around, and it works with impact, communication, persuasion. If there is no impact, you don't even know I'm there, you don't even know I'm talking, nothing happens. If there's impact but you don't know what I want, it's a lot harder to get anything to happen because you haven't communicated. If there's impact and communication but there's no persuasion, you don't see why you should do what I want. So nothing happens. You need the three things and it needs to happen this way around. We all know this, you don't, people know more about advertising before they get into advertising. 
Immediately they get into advertising, they start to learn all the long trendy textbook language and they forget how human beings work. But this is just street smarts. Real creativity is just street smarts. It's what bus drivers know, cab drivers know, it's what you knew before you got into advertising, how people work. It works every day. If I'm sitting at home on a Wednesday night watching football on the TV and I want a cup of tea, but I don't want to get up and make a cup of tea in case I miss a goal. But the wife's sitting there, she's not watching football. She could make me a cup of tea, but she doesn't know I want a cup of tea. So what have I got to do? First thing I need is impact, right? I've got to get on her radar. It's no good me thinking and thinking and thinking, I wish she'd make a cup of tea, because it will never happen. I've got to get on her radar. I've got to say, Kath, Kath, Kath. In the event, she'll say, what? I've got impact, I'm on the radar. <laughs> but she doesn't know what I want yet. Now, if I was to communicate with her the way most that modern and advertising communicates, I'd say, smooth, refreshing, <laughs> warm. Fragrant hills, nice family values, loving family situation. And then I'd sit back and wait and see what happened. But because this isn't an advertising situation, this is real life, and I actually want a cup of tea, I'll say, in a language she understands, make us a cup of tea. I've got impact, I've got communication. But I haven't got persuasion yet, because she says to me, well, why don't you make it yourself? So I'm thinking, right, well, what doesn't she like doing? The question always is, in any situation, what's in it for me? Whatever complicated strategists and planners and everybody will tell you, the human mind comes down to, what's in it for me? Whatever brand it is, whatever product it is, you're not going to do it unless there's a what's in it for me. That's how the mind works. So, I know that. So We all knew that before we got into advertising. Whatever you want from someone, there's get on the radar, make it clear what you want, and then tell them what's in it for them. So I think, what's in it for Kath? So I'm thinking, all right, it's Wednesday night, the guys come round and take the garbage out on a Thursday morning. The black plastic garbage bag, she doesn't like putting that out. So I say to her, tell you what, if you make us a cup of tea while the game's on, I'll put the garbage bag out after the game's finished. Now, if she thinks that's a good deal, I've got a sale. I've got impact, communication, persuasion. Yeah? We all know that, that's how life works. Can you think of any reason you wouldn't want every ad to work like that? Can you, would you, is it likely that you would write a brief saying, we want persuasion, but we don't want any impact or, or communication? Or we want impact, but we don't want any communication or persuasion? The most important sentence on the brief is never written on a brief. The most important sentence on the brief is never written on a brief. I've never seen it written, none of you have. The most important sentence on a brief is people must notice this advertising. Never written on a brief because everybody assumes they'll notice it just because we did it. Well, no, we know the numbers are, 90% of it is invisible. 18 billion quid isn't noticed or remembered. Above that line, 18 billion quid gets wasted. There, dies right there because nobody notices it, nobody remembers it, and as Bill Birnbach says, if no one notices your advertising, everything else is academic. Now, you can't notice all the advertising that's out there, so I have to kill the other advertising that's out there. Like the two guys in the jungle, and one guy puts on running shoes and says, I don't have to outrun the lion, I, don't have to, I just have to outrun you. I'm not walking into limbo, I'm walking into having to kill everything else in the break on either side of me. That's my job as a creative. But in every ad agency, you never have that conversation. Every conversation is here. Let's do some more strategy groups. Let's write some more briefs. Let's have some more discussions. Let's have some more meetings. Let's write a new paper. Let's write a new brief. Let's do some more research. So everything's down there. Nobody ever talks about impact or communication. Consequently, nothing happens. 90% of it is invisible because... The most important part where 90% dies is never talked about, never even written on the brief. All focus is as if every brief, every ad 
we write is going to get noticed. And all we've got to do is make sure it's noticed for the right reasons. Why 90% of perfectly strategized advertising dies. There. So, if this is our most important part, impact, for creatives, certainly. Count men and planners may be down here. But for creatives, this is what we do. Count men and planners can do this, and clients. This is our job. If, if someone says the ad was very persuasive, but nobody noticed it, I don't fire the account men, I fire the copywriter and art director. If someone says, everybody noticed the ad, but the brief was wrong, I don't fire the copywriter and art director, I fire the account men or the planner. Yeah? You can have input into each other's areas, but let's be clear, this is the striker, this is the defense. You don't do each other's, you're not responsible for each other's jobs. If we're losing by letting in too many goals, I'll fire the goalie, I don't fire the striker. We need to know how the team works. So, if this is our job up here, this is our part, impact, this is the opportunity for us, the predatory opportunity, 90% for creatives and art directors. How does that work? How does impact work? Okay. This is the software for the mind. That's the software that the mind functions on. First off, I'll give you how it works for consumers. And then because there's a lot of college graduates in the room, and I know you all like it long and complicated, I'll give you that. But this is how it works for punters, ordinary people. Imagine this is a commercial break. Here's the first commercial, second commercial, third commercial, fourth commercial, fifth commercial, sixth commercial, seventh commercial. Now the break's over and we go to bed and we get up tomorrow morning and we go to work and after work we go to the supermarket. Which one of those commercials is most likely to have survived that erosion process? We all know the answer. When we're behaving like ordinary consumers, we all know the answer. But when we're in an ad agency, we'll be discussing, is it this commercial, which is beautifully shot, or was it this one, which was done by a Swedish director, or this circle, which has a fabulous soundtrack, or this commercial, which won at Cannes, or this commercial, which had most likes on YouTube, or is it this? What we won't be talking about is which one actually fucking stood out from the rest. We won't be talking about that because that's not what ad agencies talk about. Ad agencies, like clients, talk about wanting to do everything like everybody else, but a little teeny bit better, because it's safe. Where the danger is, is being totally, totally different. And that's risky, and that's, that's not safe, that's daring. But let me tell you why it works first. It works because what you do when you do that, gestalt, the mind is a pattern-making machine. The mind, because it can't judge everything in, its, in, in detail, it has to be binary. Left, right, up, down, in, out, hot, cold, black, white, fast, slow. Later on you can get down into smaller details, but to deal with the inf massive information it has to be binary. If I do that, how many digits did I hold up? Ten. You didn't have time to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, what you did was you looked at it and you said two hands, all his digits, five on each hand, two fives is ten. So what the mind does, it's a pattern making machine. It does it in a nanosecond before you even realize it's happening. Your mind groups things. So, what your mind did here, it didn't see seven individual things and judge them very carefully, it saw two things. It saw a load of circles and an X. The mind groups things. Why is that useful to us? So, here's the human mind. Imagine this is a commercial break. And it's got 19 commercials in it. I don't, well, what's that, six? But I don't know if that's 19, but let's call it 19. For argument's sake, let's say that's 19. If I add another commercial, exactly like everybody else's, what share of the mind have I got in percentage terms? One out of 20. Five percent. 
right? But we now know the mind groups things. Here the mind sees one lump of zeros. Even I can't be bothered to count how many there are. I know they're all zeros, one lump. But if I do this, I haven't got 5%, because we know what the mind does, it groups things into everything that's like this, and everything that isn't like that. So now what share have I got? I've straight away got half your mind. I've got all of those zeros moved to one side. I don't know how many there are, just a whole load of them. And the X occupies all the territory that isn't zeros. By being different, if you read Reese and Trout, their book on um, positioning, The Battle for Your Mind, really good book for creatives, not for marketing men, but for creatives. The, when you position yourself properly, you reposition the competition. You can't, when you haven't repositioned the competition, you haven't really, you know, if this is a line, if you do a line for yourself, like together we can find the answers, you haven't repositioned anything, because I could say that for any computer. So you haven't really, but if you do what Steve Jobs did with Apple, you reposition everybody else. When you reposition yourself, when you position yourself, you reposition everybody else. This is great, great learning. Rory Sutherland said, creative people have a fear of the obvious, but they must sell their work to people who have a love of the obvious. Clients have a love of the obvious because there's security in this. There's security in doing what everybody else does. Nobody's ever explained to clients why it's wrong. Nobody ever takes the trouble to educate the client. You expect them to know what you know. If you're creative, you know this. You know you're going to separate. You know you want to own the context. You want to own the environment. And how you do that is you separate yourself off. But clients don't know that. All clients see is, oh, it's those weird, wacky creatives coming down with weird, wacky ideas to try and win an award again. So if you use the simple stuff I'm telling you to educate your clients, you've got a much better chance of them being on your side, finding better ideas. If you own the market, you don't need this. If you own the market, any, any old crap will work. But most, cli most clients don't own the market. You'll have one market leader and seven or eight who aren't the market leader. That seven or eight have to do this or they're wasting their money. If you just do this, you're growing the market for whoever's the market leader. If Pep, when Pepsi does advertising that looks like Coke, they're selling Coke. They have to do ads telling people we're not Coke for it to work. Adidas should be doing this against Nike. Certainly Apple did this against Microsoft. The, the thing to do, the real power in reducing it to what strongly repositions everybody else is the strategy. And the one thing David Ogilvy said that I really love, he said strategy is sacrifice. The real job of the strategy department, the planning department, is stripping away and stripping away and stripping away and stripping away until you get back to something so simple you cannot strip back anymore. Not as we saw at the beginning with Bob Hope adding on and adding on and adding on and adding on. Any idiot can do that. The real brains is stripping it back and stripping it back and stripping it back. If you add it on and add it on and add it on, you see, it becomes so useless, the consumers can't take it and you're part of the 90% that gets ignored and just dies. You strip it back and strip it back and strip it back to something so simple, you reposition the competition. That's the job of... Um, the strategy department. 